contrast, the 2004 Croatian accounts have a completely different structure. And although this map may not appear too dissimilar to the eye uh, than the 1950s accounts that we just saw, in fact, the disparities in the core periphery structures uh, are quite substantial. While drawing a partition on the two graphs using K-core yields six classes for each of the networks, the nodes are arrayed across these classes in remarkably different ways. So if we remember, the 1950s testimonies possessed 10 concepts within the first two core classes. By 2004, the core has been whittled down to merely two. A note about Croatian language and the Arivakti, who were those who moved to Istria from other parts of Yugoslavia after the war. In fact, at this level, we can't really even meaningfully speak of a core periphery structure anymore. By arraying the nodes according to partition classes, the periphery heavy structure of the 2004 interviews comes fully into focus. So the creation narrative is loose. Storylines simply trail off. Narrators have no coherent story to tell. Even when the Croatian narratives include the same events as the 1950s accounts or the 2004 Italian accounts, the events don't even mean the same thing anymore. Newly arrived Slavs, for example, aren't a source of threat as they are in the Italian accounts. Here they're celebrated for having added a kind of multicultural cast to the neighborhood. Now, it's not that my informants in Croatia wouldn't acknowledge that people left. My informants would admit that their neighbors and relatives left, but they nearly always connected that event with some event describing how good the immediate post-war period was. And this link renders the decision to leave senseless. Now to emphasize just how powerful this tolerance narrative is at fending off links to events about violence, the two narrators in the Croatian accounts um, are sisters of two men who were imprisoned in 1954. One of them is Nikola Dimitri's sister. And although I uncovered during an interview in Trieste that she was instrumental at getting her brother and a friend released from prison, she failed to mention the arrest in her narrative. And I tried. After she skipped over the original event, I tried sort of prodding her with questions about whether her brother had experienced problems with local authorities. But both she and this other sister and this other guy never mentioned these kinds of harassing or, or threatening events. Their accounts have evolved over a 50-year period in, in which Yugoslavia practiced extreme forms of repression in the immediate post-war years. But the Yugoslav state managed to be successful uh, not simply because they used coercion. Rather, they used policies that both pushed and pulled U the Yugoslav narrative of ethnic um, ethnic tolerance and cross-ethnic cooperation. The state pulled Istrians into the official narrative by reminding people of the mixed Italian and Slavic partisan troops that liberated the country from fascism. And this rang true for many people whose relatives had fought in the war who, or who they themselves had an ideological commitment that was in line with this. But the Yugoslavia, uh, but Yugoslavia also pushed people into the official account. It banned discussion of wartime atrocities, and it jailed offenders on penal islands under brutal conditions. Other acts of repression and a general environment of uncertainty in the post-war period instilled a sense of fear that compelled people who stayed in Istria to remain quiet. In place of a narrative about atrocities of war, Yugoslavia then promoted a history of cross-ethnic participation of all groups in the partisan resistance movement against fascism. And of course, this is what we see reflected in the 2004 accounts. So if we turn to the 2004 Italian narrative, again, we can say maybe it's not too dissimilar to the eye from the Croatian account. But when we examine the partitions, we can see three crucial things. First off, we can notice we've lost a class. We've gone from six classes to five. The Italian narrative has begun to kind of coalesce around the same types of stories. Two, we have a dumbbell-shaped distribution to the class elements. And if we look closer, we can see that the events that fall into the periphery, the sort of uh, first and second classes, are many of the events that had been core in the 1950s, which detailed protest and individual agency and power. Um, like how Mariana Pava and, and Lucia Dodic had actually resisted the local authorities. During the past 50 years, Istrians in Trieste have developed a way of speaking about the past that removes the possibility of telling a story in which you actually stand up to local authorities. Now, in 2004, you could only be a victim in Trieste. So the new events in the Italian 
county narrative, in fact, detail murder, the ransacking of homes, and how bad the slums are. And older events from the 1950s testimony that detailed victimization get pulled in and re-emphasized uh, in the contemporary Italian account. They take on an importance and become central in a way that they never had in the 1950s. Nicola Dimitri's arrest is a prime example. Although it was a somewhat marginal event in the original testimonies, its repetition and connection to other acts of discrimination pull it into the contemporary account and invest it with power beyond its original. So in sum, we started with a collection of counts in the 1950s that had some core concepts and some peripheral concepts, but mostly contained concepts that clumped up, clumped up around the summer periphery. And this makes sense, since many people had experienced the same things, but they didn't know the scope of the harassment, um, and they hadn't yet developed a common way of speaking about it. As we move into 2004, though, we can see radical differences emerging between the Croatian narratives, with their sort of periphery-heavy structure, and the Italian ones, that appear to be bifurcating into core concepts and ones that seem to be on their way out of the network altogether. These striking differences clearly show the emergence of a new salient social boundary between Istrians in Trieste and their former neighbors and friends who remained behind in Istria. So, as I jump into the conclusion today, I want to leave you with a couple of what I think are exciting possibilities for historical study of identity and social boundaries that follow from this kind of work. So in this slide, I've combined the Italian and Croatian history and narratives and rewritten the network program so that the blue arcs are representing the Italian narratives and the red arcs are the Croatian ones. And I have to say, when I first did this, I, I flipped it. So I had like the Croatian communists in blue and the Italians in red. <laughs> um, so anyway, you can clearly see that a number of the nodes appear in both sets of the narratives and they're the ones that sort of follow along this boundary. I refer to these nodes as boundary concepts. Um, they're the concepts or events that are mentioned in both accounts, but they always signify different things because the micro-events that contribute to their meanings are different. And then these concepts subsequently are connected to radically different other concepts within the narrative. And I've broken out one of these nodes, the concept of padroni, or owners of the land, to show you what I mean. Uh, and padroni is this node here in the middle. Well, when, um, when Italian historians talk about Padroni, they often say how good the fascist past was when they were owners and they had respect. Often accounts of victimization are tied to being Padroni and point to how jealous or backward or dirty the Slavs were. There's nearly always a sense of loss, even when the speaker is from a family of really meager means. When Croatians speak about Padroni, it's often to note how awful life was under fascism. We were poor. We weren't free. We were liberated from our bondage by the partisans. The word, padroni, is the same. It's the same in both sets of narratives, but the referent couldn't be more different. So boundary concepts have what I refer to as a sort of janus space quality. Often these nodes, with their countervailing meanings, concatenate into smooth chains that clearly demarcate one group from another. Padroni, for example, is tied to another boundary concept, liberation, um, which for Italians kind of shows you like the, the stark contrast here. Liberation for the Italian Istrians means that Istria, uh, it's sort of the, the retaking of Istria from the partisans by the Nazis in 1943 after Italy had capitulated. So here, the Nazis are the liberators. Uh, versus the more standard way of thinking about liberation is the triumph of the resistance movement over fascism that the Croats often mention. So this is the kind of con conventional sense of a social boundary. It's something that demarcates us from them. But if we step away from this orientation and simply look at the formal structural property of boundaries, we can immediately see that while the nodes work to kind of police a border between us and them, um, they're also a point of connection. They link just as much as they divide. My ongoing work is probing whether boundary concepts are more often a locus for narrative change than less connected events, um, and whether these are the ones that have motivated that kind of bifurcation in the Italian history and narratives, or the periphery heaviness in the Croatian case. Another property related to these ideas is the appearance of different kinds of structures to silences or gaps within the narrative. 
And I think both of these ideas offer some kind of exciting possibilities for examining narrative transformation. So, sorry. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop here and open it up to Q&A.